you're wrong. So you kids can sit on the front pew if you want, or on the floor if you want to stay there, but I want everything out of your hands, because this sermon is for you. This message is for you this morning. It is simple, but I'm hoping that there'll be some things in it that everyone can take. And you kids, I'm talking to you, so when I ask you a question, you can answer, okay? We're pretending that there's no, there's no big people here, okay? Now it's just us. All right. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible? Yeah? Do you believe just part of it or all of it? Is it important? Praise the Lord. It is important. Have you had a good look through the Bible? Sometimes you've had a look through the Bible? Have you ever seen God's signature in the Bible? You haven't. You haven't looked hard enough. Do you know what God's signature looks like? Do you think God's signature would be after something really important? Okay, if I've got an important document to sign, sometimes you've got to, when you get your a license or you sign a check, uh, write a check out, you've got to sign it. Now, when you sign it, do I just write bill when I sign my check? Or do, is there something special I put on there? Yeah, it's Bill Ringrose, but I don't just write B Ringrose, do I? I have to write my signature, don't I? Yep, okay. So, now you've never seen God's signature in the Bible. Because my signature, that says who I am. I believe God's signature is something that would be really important, would be the most important part of the Bible, because it's all important, isn't it? The whole Bible, all right? And I believe I found it. You know, I believe I found God's signature. It reveals his character, because that's who he is, so that's his signature. It was written in stone, and out of the whole Bible which was inspired, what do you think, Georgia? The Ten Commandments. It was written in stone with God's own finger. The rest of the Bible, God inspired. But that, he wrote with his own finger in stone. Okay, so his character revealed. Is he a, a good God? Is he an awesome God? Is he a perfect God? Awesome, you kids know your Bible, that's awesome. All right, now, you know the Bible stories. Most of them, some of them. The children of Israel, when they come out of Exodus, sorry, when they were in the book of Exodus, coming out of Egypt, okay, they cross the Red Sea, and then they wander around the desert, and a few little things happen, and then they come to a mountain. What was that mountain called? Mount Sinai, very good. Okay, when they hit Mount Sinai, what did God command them to do? He was going to give them what? His... What was he going to give them at Mount Sinai? What did he give them? The Ten Commandments or his signature or his show them his character. Okay. But what weren't the people allowed to do? God told them something they weren't allowed to do. When they got to the mountain, God said str something to Moses straight away. Something special. They weren't allowed to go where? On the mountain. That's right. They could come to the mountain, but they weren't to touch the mountain. Why not? Why couldn't the people go up to the mountain and have a look? Because God was... In the cloud on the top of the mountain. Why couldn't the people go up and have a, have a bit of a look at it up and see what God was like? Okay. Was God holy? Was God perfect? Were the people perfect? Were the people holy? No. So the people could not go up to see God. And if they did, if they tried, if they touched the mountain, they were to be killed. That's right. But no one was allowed to touch them. They had to stone them or shoot them with an arrow. Okay, when they had the sanctuary, you know what all the sanctuary was, eh? the tabernacle in the wilderness, why was only the high priest allowed into, to go into the temple? Why wasn't all the, just all the people allowed to go wander in and out? Oh, very good, Georgia. Okay, so once again, God's holy, he's perfect, there's no sin in the sanctuary, was there? The people were sinful, okay, so... From that, can we take that sin, can sin and God be together? They have to be separate. Okay, excellent. Did you get that, Daniel? Yep, sweet. All right. So, sin and God, we just make sure we got the sin and God can't go together. So, sin and God can't exist together. Is that right? Sweet. Do the little, bigger kids agree? Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we must be, they must be separated. Okay. Now let's go to another story in the Bible. Right back at the start of the Bible, in the beginning, who was there? God. 
And God created Adam and Eve. And they were in where? Garden of Eden. Was that an awesome place to be? We're pretty sure it's a pretty awesome place. And it's, that was a, a little bit what heaven's going to be like. So it must be pretty awesome, right? Don't you think? Okay. Now, they had something special with God in the Garden of Eden. What were they able to do in the Garden of Eden? With God. What were they able to do with God? And talk to Him. Just like we're talking now. That's how they talk to God. It's like, hey God, how's it going? Cheers. Do you think they were like that? Just, just relax there and talk to Him? Yeah. And do you think God sat down and explained a whole lots of stuff to them? Do you think it would have been pretty awesome to be with Adam and Eve and, and um, God in the Garden of Eden? Yeah, it was something pretty special. But in the tree, there was all, in, in the Garden of Eden, there was also what? A tree. Yeah, I blew that, didn't I? That's all right. There was a tree. And that tree, what was that tree for? They weren't allowed to eat the fruit. Okay. So did they have a choice? Or were they just told, you're not allowed to touch that tree. And, I'm, and God said, I'm going to put electric fence around that tree so you can't actually get to that tree. They had a choice. So did God give them a free choice? Yep. Okay, he gave them free choice. Now, Adam and Eve, being in such awesome people in an awesome place, and not wanting to destroy anything, did they choose right and stay away from that tree? No. They what? Chose? They had made the wrong choice, didn't they? And they ate the fruit. So what happened then? They were what? Banished from the garden. Okay, so did that change things between them and God? Yes, it would have had to change things. So they did wrong, they chose wrong. So would you say that they sinned? Yes, and because of the sin, the result of that sin, they were what? Punished? Do you think there was some separation from God? Yeah, okay, so we see it again. If there's sin, there's what? If you go for sin, can you be where God is? Yeah, there's separation, isn't there? There's a gap between you and God. Okay. Did any of you bring your Bibles? No. Oh, it's okay. We'll just have a quick look. So how many of it, and we're just using the Bible because we need to clarify this to make sure that we understand. How many of us have sinned? And some of the adults might know this in Romans 3.23. How many of us have sinned? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so how many of us have sinned? Just me? Am I the only sinner here? Oh, we all. Just you. Just you and me, eh? No, no, we're all. Okay, we're all of us. Okay, so all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Okay, because we have sinned, if you sin, there needs to be a penalty. What's the penalty for sin? Oh, so I don't have to look it up. Shall we look it up anyway just to check? Romans 6.23. It's all in Romans. Romans 6.23. And when I find it, for the wages, so what's the wages? That's the payment or the wages of sin is death. Oh, you guys know your Bible's too good. Okay. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Very good. Man, you fellas know heaps of texts. You don't even know you know them. Yeah, good. That's awesome to see. Okay, so how many, is a, how many of us have sinned? All of us. And what's the result or the penalty of sin? Death. All right. So what's the point then? What, what hope? Have we got any hope? Well, how, how do we have hope when they have the... We've, Jesus paid the... All right. In Romans 5 and verse 8, what does it say there? It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us. Okay, do you get that? So God demonstrates his love. So he doesn't just say it. He demonstrates, or he does it. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that pretty awesome? That's not just pretty awesome. That's really awesome. Okay, so putting that back into our separation with sin. So we've sin, we're separated from God, and we've all sinned, so we're all separated from God. True? Christ died for us. 
So he made a way possible. So how do we get come back to close the gap? What do we have? To, is there anything we have to do? Mm, maybe. What was that? Ask for forgiveness, okay? First of all, we have to know the story of, of that we're sinners and that the penalty for sin is death. We need to know that first because there's people around who don't even know that. That's a bit sad, isn't it? Yeah, but that's fine. That's some bit. But do we know? Yeah. And do we know that Jesus died for us? Yep. Okay, so then we need to ask for forgiveness. Is that something we just maybe should do? That's... We should do, yeah. It's, it's important that we ask for forgiveness. Because it doesn't really matter what situation we find ourselves in, we need to ask for forgiveness, do we? Will Jesus always forgive us? It's really important to remember that. Jesus will always forgive us. It doesn't matter what we do, where we go, what we find ourselves doing, when we realize it's wrong, Jesus will forgive us. All right. Jesus is pretty awesome. There's a thing called grace and mercy. And that's something pretty special that God gives us. We don't deserve it, do we? We deserve to die, but Jesus took our place. You know, when I was younger, not much, I was a little bit older than you, you know what I used to think? I used to think, hmm, why can't I just go and do things that are wrong? Like, say, why can't I just go to the shop and take something off the shelf, which would be what? If I just took it out and walked out, stealing, okay, we'll just use that as an example. Why can't I just go to the shop? I know it's wrong, but I'll go to the shop and I'll take some chewing gum or some lollies off the shelf and I'll walk out of the shop. And I know it's wrong, but then I'll ask Jesus to forgive me and that'll be all sweet again. Would that be right? If I ask for forgiveness, would it be right? Would, would Jesus forgive me if I asked for forgiveness and I was really sorry for it? Yes, he would. <laughs> You're not sorry for it. But at the time, I, I would have been. But do you know what I realized as I got to know Jesus? Because Jesus... I didn't always have Jesus as my friend. Not, I knew Jesus, but I didn't have him as my good friend. And it's really important to have him as your good friend. And do you know what I figured out or realized? Because what did Jesus do? Died for us on the cross. And when he died for us on the cross, where did, my, where did our sins go? On Jesus on the cross. So if I do something wrong and I know I'm going to do something wrong... I, before I even do it, I know that I'm going to do something wrong. What's going to motivate me to stop me doing that? And you know what I figured out? That when I go and do something wrong and I know, and then I ask Jesus to forgive me for that, I've actually helped to kill him. Now, is that a really nice thought? Would you like to do that to your friend? Would you like to, oh, this is my friend, but I'm going to help kill him. Would that be pretty cool? No. And that's what we do to Jesus. Is Jesus supposed to be our friend? Is Jesus supposed to be our friend? Yeah. Just a little friend or a, or a, a real friend? Real, in fact, he's our forever friend. He's our forever friend. So do you think you'd like to try and help to kill your forever friend? So how do we not do that? Don't sin. How do we not sin? Okay, and that includes spending time with him. Do you know it's really hard to spend time with Jesus? Even for me this week, it was really hard to spend time with Jesus. And I had, this, I had to get this prepared. And even last night, I had it, all the thoughts there, and I had made some notes and bits and pieces. And I've had a really, really busy week. It's just been, everything's been happening. It's been a jumble this week. And I came here last night. I was about, I don't know, it was some time. And I sat at the back there. And you know, it took me about an hour for me to unwind, just to get my head off, off everything. And a couple of things hit me yesterday. And I basically, I had to spend time with God and ask Him just to take those things off me just so that I could spend time and focus on, on this. It's really important to spend time with Jesus. And, that, and what's some ways you could spend time with Jesus? Prayer? Prayer is a, is a really awesome one. Uh, yep, coming to church. What other things could you do? Reading the Bible, studying the Word. Very good. And what about just listening to Him? So it's, sometimes it's not just talking, sometimes it's just listening. Sitting there being quiet. Is it hard to be quiet? Just sit and do nothing. Is it hard to do that? Yeah. All right. Okay. So the more time, I'll just sort of catch up here. Um, so we must spend time with Jesus with prayer, Bible study, and quiet time. If we spend time with Jesus, do you think the choices that we need to make 
or that we make every day will be good choices? If we spend time with Jesus, do you think that we'll start making better choices? Of course we will. And we will reflect how important Jesus is. So do you think people around us will start noticing a difference? Yeah. And do you think that we'll be brought closer together, not separated? Yes, we'll be brought back together. Do you know that we're on a rebel planet? This planet Earth is a rebel planet. You like to think that? That you're a rebel. You're all rebels. Little rebels. Yeah, I'm a little, <laughs> yeah, I am too. I'm a big rebel. Okay, so we're all rebels. And naturally, we want to be, do you think we want to be good naturally? Do you think we, we naturally, if there was nothing around us, we would naturally want to be good? Would you? Oh, praise the Lord. You guys, are, you guys naturally want to be good. Because I know I naturally want to be bad. I naturally want to be a rebel. If I didn't have Jesus in my life, I would want to do things that are bad. Just that would be who I, naturally I'd want to do things that are wrong. Because that's how we're built. That's our DNA for planet Earth, is we want to be naturally bad. Because this planet is in a war. Do you know that? This planet is in a war. Who's the war with or against? Satan versus God. Do you know that Satan doesn't have any rules? Do you know that? Satan has no rules. Do you know what Satan's out to do? Okay, to separate us from God, which would mean he would do what to get us to separate us from God? He would cause us to or make us to sin. Thank you. Okay, that's what he's out to do. Does he really care about us? Okay, because there's some things out there that seem pretty cool to do, but they're not actually that good to do. Why d so that would mean what? That Satan, he, he influences things around us and, and gives us those opportunities and we choose. Does Satan really care about us? No, he does not. Do you know what Satan cares? He cares about Jesus. And do you know what he cares about Jesus? Thank you, Georgia. He does not want anyone to have a relationship with Jesus. That's what he cares about. Because when someone has a relationship with Jesus, it proves that Jesus, Jesus loves them. So he's out to destroy and to pull apart. He's, a, he's all about, for him, it's all about payback to Jesus. He tried to get to Jesus when Jesus was, was on this earth. Did he get to Jesus? No. He tries to distract us. How would he distract us, do you think? Television, games, stuff. Would he, get us, would he put stuff in front of us? That can be a way. It, there's some good stuff out there. You don't have to become, go and live in a box somewhere in the middle of a mountain because you don't want to have stuff, but you have to be careful. It involves stuff. Sometimes does he use people to get at us? Yes, he can. And that is really scary. He makes us focus on us. What's the middle letter of sin? Did you get it? What's the middle letter of sin is I. He makes us slaves. And if you were here last week, you would have heard the pastor talking about that. He makes us slaves. He forces us, actually, to be his agents. Now, would you like to be classed as a, an agent for Satan? There's things to think about. On the other hand, Jesus. Is that someone good to talk about? Yeah. Do you think Jesus forces us into anything? Do you think it, Jesus forces us in, into anything? No. He gives us what sort of choice? Does he make us choose? Free choice. True freedom. Do you think Jesus cares? Yes, he does. He cares so much for each one of us. When we start thinking like that, don't be tempted to think that God's a namby-pamby God. Do you think, ever think like that, that God's soft and a bit namby-pamby? I know there's people around that do. Was God definite? Is God definite? Yes. Back in Noah's day, God wanted to wipe mankind from the face of the earth. Why? Wicked and evil, which would be sinful. All right. 
So do you think God is just grumpy or in a spoil sport? Do you think he's fair and just? Yeah. Does God have feelings? Because after that, when in the Bible, when he says that in Genesis 6, 5, about the wanted to wipe the people from the face of the earth, he then tells a little bit about himself. Do you know what he says? Do any of you know? It's in Genesis 6, 6. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth. His heart was filled with pain. Does that show that God has feelings? Yeah, he really cares. Does he want only the best for us? And there comes a point when things can't continue anymore, doesn't there? Did it happen in Noah's day? There was an end, wasn't there? The end is coming for this world too. Are you happy that you're a Seventh-day Adventist? Are you excited about what you know? Do you think we should ask that to the big, big people out there? Are they excited about what you know? Half of them have gone to sleep, but that's all right. Are they excited about what you know as Seventh-day Adventists? Do you think we need to be definite about who we are and what we believe? We need to live our lives in such a way by our actions and attitudes that those around us will want to know more. I see some kids sometimes, and I praise the Lord for it, they invite their friends along to church. And you know what? Their friends are happy to come along because I've seen these kids and that they're different. And they want to see what it's all about, this church thing. Come to Sabbath school, and they hear all the stories and well, how exciting it is, and just, just to be around. And some of them come to their homes and stay at their homes. How awesome is that? Praise the Lord. You know, we need to have enthusiasm. Have we got enthusiasm? Do you know what enthusiasm is? That's a big word. I shouldn't use big words, should I? Do you have enthusiasm? Yeah? Are you excited? Are you energized? Do you know what that means? Yeah. Energized about God? So we must have enthusiasm. Be excited. Don't get distracted or influenced to go against God and separate ourselves from Him. Jesus is calling this morning. He's calling to you and He's calling to me. We're going to sing a couple of songs now. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.
have a story for the grown-ups. I said I would. There was a certain teacher, and it was Mr. Miller. And Mr. Miller, he taught a couple of classes, but one of his classes that he had to teach was Bible. It's in a high school. And Mr. Miller had been going through the through his lessons that he would had sort of planned and and as he was getting close to the term he noticed that he felt that he hadn't really really got the message through to these kids that what he was trying to portray he was trying to get through them the gospel and and Jesus and he also noticed that there was one kid in particular that that sort of hung around the class but didn't really get involved in any of the discussions and sort of sat at the back and was the last one in and the first one out and basically didn't really didn't really fit too, like didn't get really into it. And, and Mr. Miller had a thing for this kid, and this kid was Jack. And Jack was an athletic type of person. He was always doing things out down the gym and, and working out and mucking around. And, and Mr. Miller came up with an idea. And he knew that the final lesson for the term was coming up, and that the kids would all be on holiday. And he wanted to do something that would really set it off or really get the message home. So he got alongside, called Jack as the class was finishing. He said, Jack, can I see you for a minute? And Jack said, yeah, no worries. So he come back in and he said, Jack, I know you're fit and you're, you're into doing all, all sorts of different, you know, fitness stuff. He said, can you do push-ups? And Jack said, yeah, I can do push-ups. He said, how many can you do? Oh, I can do 100. He said, oh, you can do 100. Yeah, I can do 100. He said, can you do something for me with push-ups? He goes, yeah, no problem. I think he's going to have to do a bit of a display. And he said, I want you to do push-ups, but I want you to do them. I want you to be able to do them in sets of 10. He said, yeah, no worries. How many do you want? He said, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 sets of 10. Yeah, no problem. He said, I want you to be ready for them in three weeks' time because that's our final lesson before term ends. Yeah, no worries. I'll be ready for that, Mr. Miller. So Mr. Miller left it with Jack. And the final class arrived and all the kids were sitting there and sort of it was the last class before the end of the day as well, so the kids are sort of all itching and scratching and, and sort of excited about holidays coming and not really paying much attention. And so Mr. Miller didn't say too much. He just went and closed the door to the room when everyone was seated and he just sat there for a while. And after a while, the, the noise sort of quietened down and everyone noticed that Mr. Miller was just sitting quietly. And he said, I have something special for you kids today. And the kids were all excited about that. Oh, something, you're going to get something. So there was a, a certain smell they noticed when they come in the room, and there, there's a big paper bag just behind Mr. Miller's desk. And they sort of, hmm, that smells good. Whatever's in there must be, must be something. And why are we having a shared lunch today? Mr. Miller's supplying. So anyway, all the kids sort of said, hey, you ready to go, Mr. Miller? And he said, yeah. He said, Jack. I've asked Jack to do something special for me today. And with that, Jack jumps up and comes over beside Mr. Uh, stands by Mr. Miller. And Mr. Miller says, I've got something special for you. And with that, he goes over to the bag and picks the bag up and brings it over and pulls out this beautiful donut, ice, icing donut and cinnamon and, and puts it on a desk. And he put it on the desk in front of the first row student, who was Anna. Anna was an academic type who was right into sitting in the front row, doing all the work, getting involved. And Mr. Miller said, would you like that donut? Oh, yes, please. Jack, can I have you 10 push-ups? Jack's down, does the 10, shh, jumps back up, no worries. Donut's yours. And with that, Anna starts eating, oh, this is nice. When the kids all rubbing their hands together. Then he, comes, then he moves along and Betty's the next in line and she's the, like the cheerleader type who's Wants to be in the front of the class because it's a good place because all the boys are looking at you at the front. and um, You do the work, but you don't do too much. and You just sit there and um, get all the attention. And um, he goes, would you like a donut? Oh, Mr. Miller, my figure. I don't know if I should or shouldn't. Jack, can you do 10 push-ups? So sort of some funny looks happening now. And Jack's down to 10 push-ups, jumps back up, places the donut on her desk. She sort of breaks it in half and, and eats half. The next in line was Frank. Now Frank also worked at the gym, and he was the played 
played rugby and was sort of fairly big and, and fairly fit. And before Mr. Miller could ask him, he said, I'll do my own push-ups. Mr. Miller said, this is my classroom, this is my rules, Jack, 10 push-ups. And with that, he put the donut on the desk. And he moved around the class, one student at a time. By the time they got onto the second row, Jack was starting to weary a little bit because of the, you know, the, the quickness of, the, of doing the push-ups. And the kids could see that there's something a bit deeper here. And of course, when you have donuts and smell like that and teenagers and, and the bell's gone and there's other kids walking past, they're sort of looking because here's a class that's still in. No noise in that class. So they're looking through the window and looking and, and Mr. Miller pr proceeds and gets right to the back of the class. And by this time, everyone is watching Jack because Jack's really struggling. They have 35 kids in the class. So he's done 350 push-ups now and he is really struggling. And the kids are cheering, come on, Jack, you can do it. The kids that are receiving their donuts haven't got a dry eye. And then he gets to the last person, and just as he does that, the door cracks open. And there's three or four kids couldn't resist it anymore, and I'd open the door. And Mr. Miller turns to Jack and says, we'll let them in? Yes, sir. Three more kids come in and then realize what was going on. They're already in the room. So Mr. Miller walks over to them and places a donut in front of them. Jack, 10 more push-ups. 10 more push-ups, Jack. 10 more push-ups. You know, we are all in God's classroom, and the classroom is called life. We might think that the rules don't apply, or maybe there's too many rules. It doesn't matter who you are, or what you have done, or haven't done. That donut called eternal life, has been placed on your desk. The push-ups have been done. Will you take hold of that donut, feel, taste and see? Or will you leave this free gift sitting on your desk? The choice is yours. As we sing the final song, let us appreciate what we cost heaven and in our sinful state the need of a saviour and a forever friend. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make this wretch his treasure. Let us pray. Lord, I just come before you this morning, Lord. We just want to thank you so much for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, Lord. We know, Lord, it was our sins that held him there, Lord. He looked forward to this time and place. Each one of us is so important to you, Lord. I just ask, Lord, that the young people and the children, Lord, will have realized, Lord, the importance of having a relationship with you. Realize that the devil is wanting to, wanting to tear us away from you, Lord. Help them to choose you. Lord, help us not to lose perspective of sin and the ultimate consequence and the fact that we have free choice. Help us to ask ourselves, Lord, who is my master, Satan and self or Christ? to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Be with us, Lord.